Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 16 of the Creative Kindergarten Podcast. My name is Amanda, and I am an early childhood educator facilitator in Ontario, Canada. And this is my podcast that I love to talk to you about different topics that arise in a kindergarten classroom. You guys send me some ideas of what you'd like to hear about, and I talk about my experiences that have been in the kindergarten from being in kindergarten. Um, this is year six of being in full day kindergarten, and today I'm going to talk to you about behavior management. <music> This was a request for me to talk about behavior management in kindergarten that I got from one of my listeners. I had asked on Instagram for you guys to send me any of your um, questions that you had about working in kindergarten. And this is one that came up and I'm a little bit hesitant to even do a whole episode on it because there's not much to how I do behavior management in my kindergarten classroom. I know that sounds really boring and really off, but I thought I could talk about the different strategies that I've heard of and talk maybe a little bit about what I do, but it's really hard to talk about behavior management I find in kindergarten because each year is so different and each kid is so different that I, I don't really have like a set of rules that I follow for kindergarten. So I'm just going to talk a little bit in general about what I've done in the past and talk a little bit about things that I've heard other people use and my thoughts on them. And maybe just if you guys have any more questions, I'll put a post or something on Instagram and you can send me some more questions and I can talk about it there. So make sure you're following me on Instagram because that's kind of where I do the most talking. And if you have any questions, I, I'm great at answering DMs that get me get sent there. I'm usually right away answering most of everybody's messages that I get. So I'll make sure I'll leave a link in the show notes, but I'm at Creative Kindergarten Blog on TPT on Instagram, and that's just a great place to find me. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just leave a comment down below and ask me any questions that you have, and I'll come over and I'll answer those there for you. So behavior management in kindergarten can be so hard, especially in Ontario where I am because kids can start as young as three years old. I've talked about this in the past, but full day kindergarten in Ontario actually um, starts for students whenever they're going, like in the year that they're going to be turning four. So if a child has a birthday on December 31st, they can start kindergarten when they're three. So we have a lot of students that start when they're three years old. If they have a September, October, November, December birthday, they're going to come to us at three. And we have to remember that, like, and I find that's probably the hardest part for me is remembering just how young some of these kids are. Like some, there's like some kids that have like a January 1st birthday. So they will be a whole year older and you're holding on to these high standards for these kids that are a whole year older than these younger kids. And because it's a two year program, you can have a kid that's almost turning six in the same classroom that a kid's just turning four. So that two year difference in ages can be such a huge gap, especially for behaviors. And I always have to try to keep that in the back of my mind when something's going on and just remembering like these kids are so young. They're coming to us and some of them are just out of diapers and they're just getting toilet trained. And we have really high expectations for some of these students. And I just have to sit back and say, okay, they're only three years old. They're only four years old. Like, are my standards just too high? So behavior management for me sometimes is a lot of just realizing that my expectations are just way too high for the age that they're at and just taking a step back and really thinking about how their behavior is could just be based on their age. And this I'm talking about small behaviors. I'm not talking about... Um, like throwing items across a room or hurting people. I'm just talking about like the, the general silliness at such a young age, the silliness that young children can have and that it's okay to have, right? They're just exploring boundaries and exploring what they can and can't get away with. And so having um, that realization, that, that thought in the back of my head that sometimes they're just three years old and you know what, they're being silly because they're three. And yeah, so that's one of my major things about classroom management is looking at their age group and realizing that maybe it's just developmentally where they're at right now. So that's my first thing. Classroom management, is it based on age? If it's based on age, then you just have to approach it in a way that you would approach anything that um, a three-year-old or a four-year-old can and can't do. And that's just teach them the behavior that you would like to see. So if they're being silly, I don't know, um, they're calling out or they're rolling around on the carpet or 
they're calling out names um, like calling people names or something like that like something that's just really silly they don't mean to be mean they're just they like they just can't it's almost like they can't control themselves especially like things like rolling around on the carpet or um, running in the classroom or little things the, the smaller sillies that can happen throughout the day it's just all about teaching them the behavior that you would like them to see so if they're rolling around on the carpet first of all are you making them sit too long on the carpet Three-year-olds aren't supposed to be able, aren't supposed to be sitting for long periods of time at the carpet. Maybe it's just changing the location that they're at. So maybe it's just cutting your carpet times a bit shorter if they can't sit still for that long. So rolling around at the carpet, if they can't sit still for that long, maybe you're changing up how they're sitting. Maybe you're giving them a wiggle chair or something like that. If it's during classroom times where they're running around the classroom, they're being silly with um, center materials, they're not using the materials in an appropriate fashion, well, then just reteach expectations. So there was one year our kindergarten classroom, we were really boy heavy. We were so boy heavy and they just weren't using materials properly. Things were getting broken and not out of meanness, just out of just not using it properly. And so my teaching partner and I had a real conversation of, are we just going to take everything out of our classroom and start from zero and then slowly bring everything in and show them how to use everything step by step. And we decided in the end, we had a conversation with the class and we told them that that's what we were going to do if they couldn't um, start using materials properly. And they were able to change their behaviors slowly, but surely with, constant reminders, constant explicit teaching on how to use things and just being on top of it constantly is how we were able to change that behavior around. And that's the thing, you just have to constantly explicitly teach. Like kids coming in who are three years old, they might not be able to use a pair of scissors. So having the expectation that they're just going to come in and use scissors or use glue or use whatever center materials you have set out without even showing them how to use it, I don't think that that is setting yourself up for success or setting them up for success. You really have to start at the basics and teach them how to use everything. Everything from the using the bathroom to washing their hands to how to use a glue stick to how to put away center materials. Step by step, show them by bringing out the materials and doing it yourself in front of them, showing them how to do each step is really how we do it. And so, yeah, it's, it's the explicit teaching part that comes in at that time. And if they're not doing it, well, then they're not able to use it. And that's been my rule in kindergarten since day one. If I've shown you how to use the material, I know you are able to use the materials properly, but now you're choosing not to use it properly then you don't get to use it anymore. And I've taken things away and told kids that they can't play there anymore. Um, dice, I'll just use this as a, an example. So dice, sometimes when we have dice games and the kids are throwing the dice and they're being thrown across the room, not as a mean way as in like I'm pitching it across the room, but they're just being silly and they're throwing it too hard or too high or whatever it is. And the dice goes flying. Well, the first time I'm going to come over and I'm going to show them how to roll it gently. The second time I'm going to give them a gentle reminder of like, okay, we're just going to roll it gently. Let's do it together. Let's see that you can roll it gently on your own. And then the third time, well, now you don't get to play anymore and you don't get the dice. And now it's really boring that you don't get to play the game. And so giving them the chances to correct the behavior, showing them how to use it, giving them a chance. And then afterwards, you don't get to use it. Let's try again tomorrow. And I think that kind of tough love, I guess I would call it, the tough love, um, I've given you lots of chances, now you're showing me that you're not going to use it properly, well then you don't get to use it, that's just how it's going to be. And that's pretty much been my behavior management strategy since day one. Um, if you're not going to use things properly, you, you don't get to use it. Um, if uh, your students as a whole in a class are not using um, things properly, I've actually... I forget what it is called, but there is a method of teaching students how to use um, resources in their classroom where they come into school on the first day of school and there's literally nothing out. And what you do is you slowly build up classroom resources by bringing one item in at a time. So let's say if you're going to have an activity with scissors, you would introduce scissors that day and you would have to stu show students explicitly how to use scissors and now scissors are available. 
Well, then the next day you need glue. Well, now we're going to build on your knowledge of using scissors and we're going to add glue to the environment. Now you want to use puzzles. We're going to add puzzles into the environment after I show you how to use them. So that method of just coming into an empty classroom and slowly building it up could happen at any point throughout the year. So you're noticing right now that your kids are not using um, glue sticks properly. The glue is getting all smushed. The glue is um, all the caps are left off. There's glue all over the table, whatever, whatever um, behavior you're seeing or whatever material they're misusing. Well, take it away. We're going to take away all of the glue sticks. And then we're going to slowly reintroduce to glue sticks until you can show me you know how to use it. And it, it's really, I, I guess it's really simple, but it's just been a really effective way for us to, to transition students into a classroom environment and to using classroom tools that a lot of people have to use. So again, keeping in mind that some of these kids are really young, they're coming from houses where um, they can just use whatever they want whenever they want mom and dad or siblings are going to clean up after them they can do it's a one on either a one on one environment or a very close to being a one on one environment to having a classroom with 30 people using all the same stuff that's an adjustment for our students and we have to come to realize that they need us like we're their educators we're their teachers they they need we need to teach them even just how to use materials we don't only have to teach them how to sing the alphabet and learn their numbers we're also teaching them how to use materials and how to be responsible for uh, communal supplies i guess i would call it so that's my uh number one behavior management i guess it's just really slowly taking it easy and introducing materials and explicitly teaching on how to use materials because I guess that's the number one complaint that I've heard is that like students just don't use things properly and um, I guess I'll give an example of just um, what happened one day in my kindergarten classroom and this has happened to me one time in six years of kindergarten this has happened to me one time and I'm kind of surprised it's only happened one time a kid came up to me and I looked at his bangs and I looked him in the eyes and I said oh what happened to your hair and he looked at me and he smiled and one of the other kids said, oh, he gave, just gave himself a haircut and he had snipped off a huge chunk of his bangs, like a huge chunk. You could clearly see he had given himself a haircut and I was mad. Uh, we have always told our students that the scissors are for paper. We don't use the scissors on anything else. The scissors stay at the table. We use them for paper. And he lost his right to scissors that day. I said, well, next time we have to do an activity where you need scissors, a teacher is going to have to sit with you and stay with you until you finish the scissors. Then the teacher is going to take away the scissors and you won't be able to use them on your own. And believe you me, he never cut his hair again because he realized that having scissors is, is just not a given. You can get anything taken away. And so that's the one and only time that has happened to me. And I was mortified and I had to tell his mom that the kid had given him, himself a haircut and the mom was fine with it in the end and she wasn't mad at all. But at the same time, like these parents are giving you their kid and they expect to get their kid in the same condition that they left them at school in the morning as. So I felt like I had let her down. And in the end, it's only a small chunk of hair that went missing. But it, we didn't want it to become a, a pattern in the classroom. So again... After he had done that without naming names or doing anything like that, we talked again at the carpet when we came back as a whole group. We talked again about how scissors are only for paper, reinforced that concept, talked about how if we use scissors for anything else, then we're not going to have scissors anymore in our classroom. And like I said, that's the one and only time that's ever happened to me. Does that work for every student ever? No. Some students just how can I put this um, in a nicely nicer way? Have uh, maybe poor impulse control who don't know how to use um, centers materials appropriately or materials in the classrooms appropriately. They might just have poor impulse control. They can't control the fact that they um, get a pair of scissors and they just want to cut everything up. Well, in that case, then that's going to take a lot more explicit one-on-one -on -one teaching. That's going to take somebody sitting with them and really helping them um, learn how to control those impulses. And you might need other professionals to be involved in that too and getting those impulses under control so that they can use center materials properly. Again, remembering that these kids are three, four, five years old and that they're not going to do the right thing every time because just developmentally, they're... they're 
their brains just aren't there yet. So just having that understanding that, um, like I wouldn't have taken scissors away from that, from that child who cut his hair for the rest of the year. I gave it an appropriate amount of time till he was able to show me that he could use scissors by himself, which is a couple days later, probably. And there was not a big deal. So really making sure that the, um, I guess, I don't want to say the punishment, but like, I'll call it a punishment even though it's not a punishment but the punishment fits the crime so I'm not he he cut a little bit of a chunk of his hair off he's not going to lose scissors for the rest of the year he uses loses scissors for a little bit of time if he had done it again yeah maybe he would have lost scissors for a bigger period of time but he never did it again so we did it didn't come to that so making sure that your when you're taking things away or you're redirecting behaviors it fits to what they've done so that you don't give them a huge punishment, for lack of a better word, for something that's relatively minor. Another thing that is really important for classroom management, I find, especially in kindergarten, is building the relationships with your students. So having that trust and that ability for students to come and be able to talk to you and work through things with them instead of them being scared to come to you. So I find that's a big thing when students get scared of having to come to talk to you. They don't want to come to talk to you and they're trying to deal with things on their own. That can lead to even bigger problems. So I have a little girl that I'm thinking of who very rarely got upset. Very, very rarely did she ever get upset. And she got really upset one day and she, I don't even know what she, I think she started yelling really loudly in the classroom. And me knowing this student and having built up a really strong relationship with her, I was able to pull her aside. I calm her right down and bring her back down to a level that she was able to talk to me and we were able to talk through the problem and solve it. And for her, it was, I need to leave the room. I need to go for a walk. I need to get some air and then I can come back and try to solve this again. And knowing that that child, that's what they need at that time and pulling her out of the room instead of getting mad at her because she's screaming in the classroom and going up to her and may give, giving her trouble for it, knowing that kid and having built a relationship and that trust between us, that she was able to talk with me and talk through it, I think that's really important. That comes into play a lot in kindergarten with the younger kids, is having that relationship so that they can come to you if they're having a problem or if they're sad or upset about something, that they have that trusted adult that they can go to. So. Yeah, building a relationship in kindergarten can be hard sometimes because they're young and there's so many of them in a classroom. But I feel like that's probably one of the more important things in, in, in for classroom management is having a relationship with these kids. Because if you don't have a relationship, they're not going to trust you. They're not going to want to come to you. And if they're getting in trouble, they're going to shut down or they're not going to respond. And so having um, built a solid foundation prior to any problems arising really helps when you need to um, solve those issues that may come up. I talked a little bit now about things that I have done. So I've um, explicit teachings and building relationships. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about things that I don't necessarily do or agree with in a kindergarten classroom. Um, again, um, as for all of my podcasts, these are my own personal views. These are just my own personal opinions. They are not judgments on anything that anybody does. So if you do these things in your classroom, this is not a judgment on you. This is just how I feel about things. And I need just a moment of self-reflection for myself and for anybody listening. But I know a lot of people use things like clip charts. So everybody starts at, I don't even know, at a five and then if you do something wrong you get clipped down to a four or if you do something wrong again you get clipped down to a three or a two or a one sometimes people use colors or people use like happy faces and sad faces or mad faces whatever it could be so clip charts i have a real problem with clip charts just because i feel like it's public shaming the whole class can see them. If a kid is having a rough day and now you're clipping them down on top of that, it's just escalating the fact that they've had a rough day. It's making their day worse instead of helping them make it better. It's not it's not constructive. It's not helping them make a better choice. It's just telling them that they have done a bad choice. So using clip charts for me is just not appropriate for a kindergarten classroom. Again, these are all my opinions. If you use a clip chart, you might have your own reasons for them. But I just find that when you use a clip chart, you're just 
you're not helping solve any problems. You're really just telling them that there is a problem. So the clip chart itself, I feel like is not a useful tool for helping solve the problem because you can help some solve the problem without having to publicly clip them down. And so now other students also know, hey, you've, you're at a one, you're having a bad day. And it just creates a negative feeling around a child that might already be having a negative day. They might not be having, um, be like, instead of pumping up their tires, you're really deflating them. I feel like is the best metaphor for this situation. So I've never used a clip chart. I don't think I ever would use a clip chart. It's not something that I see um, as an effective tool to help with behavior management in a kindergarten classroom. It's just um, a way to have students visually see that they're having a bad day when really I think they already know by their internal feelings. And I know I've heard a lot of stories of kids going home and already being sad about the fact that, you know, I got in trouble, but also I was put down to a one. And now they're on top of that, they're feeling that public shame in for that. When really, again, they're young. They're so young and putting that pressure on them, I feel like is just too much. Uh, it's, I think the same thing for dojo points. And so you could say, oh, dojo points are not public. The other kids can't see them. Well, yeah, but then they go home and now their parents have gotten messages all day or whatever. They've looked at the points all day. I'm not sure exactly how it works. And now they know that their kid's coming home and they've had a bad day. And then their parents are going to talk to them about the bad day. And then it's just a cycle of the kid just like not being able to let go of maybe a bad choice that they made in the morning where maybe they were able to turn it around, they had a great afternoon, but now they've lost dojo points or whatever it might be. And so again, I, I really don't believe in extending the um, punishment further than it needs to go. So I'm trying to think about times when kids maybe have gotten in trouble in school and I've had to tell parents that the kids have gotten in trouble in school for whatever it may be. I didn't tell parents about every little thing, but maybe it was something bigger, like when the kid cut his hair and the parents would be like, oh, I'll, I'll have, they'll get punished at home. And I would, I would normally say like, oh, please don't. Like they've already had a punishment at school. They've, are, I've already spoken to them. They've already had um, that moment. You don't need to do anything more at home other than maybe just have a conversation just to make sure that they're making better choices tomorrow. But I never want them to be double punished. I never want a student to get punished. I'm using punished. It sounds really negative. I'm just whatever the consequence of whatever happened. I don't want them to have also consequences at home when they've already had consequences at school. Like they've already dealt with it. We've already moved past it. We're trying to be positive about that and help them make better choices. Giving them more consequences isn't going to help the situation. So I feel like dojo points just kind of accentuate that and just are really... Um, another way to shame them, but it not being public, I guess. So I've never used, so I've never used clip charts. I've never used Dojo. Um, the one thing that we have done in the past is um, we've read the book, How to Fill Your Bucket. And then afterwards, I know a lot of people do this. They have an actual bucket. And then every time um, uh, students are making positive choices, we add gems to the bucket. And when the bucket is filled up, then we get a classroom reward. And Again, this is pumping up their tires instead of deflating them because you're always seeing the positive, the positive, the positive and pointing out those all those positive behaviors to our students is really um, how to deflect off of the negative. So we're going to ignore the negative behavior and really pump up the positive ones. So we've um, I've always loved to do the fill a class saying um, the class fill your bucket challenges because then, you know, then you get a classroom party or you get to have a dance party or sometimes. I forget what one year they wanted. Oh, they wanted a balloon dance or they wanted to do, or they wanted extra recess time. Some things that are really simple that really get the classroom excited. And then they can, it just helps them make those positive choices throughout the day instead of focusing on the negative choices that have happened. And that's another thing that I like to focus on. It's just, you made a bad choice. It's not that they did something wrong or that they broke a rule. I always tell them like, oh, we need to make a better choice now. And just how I use my words and how I talk to kids about things, um, making sure to put a positive spin on them. It's not a bad kid. It's not a, a bad day. They just made one bad choice in that moment. And how can we make better choices from now on? 
And so even having those discussions with the kids, um, you're throwing the dice. Well, how can we have, uh, how can we make a better choice here? What can we do to make a better choice? Do you need to, um, when you're rolling the dice, do it on the ledge so that it's hitting the wall and coming back to you instead of it flying across the room? Do we need to get you the foam dice instead of the little plastic ones so that they're bigger so that when you're rolling it, it you don't need to roll it as hard or as far because it's so much bigger and, and just helping them to realize that they can make better choices. They can um, do better in the classroom and really pumping them up again instead of bringing them down. So that was for like the little minor things that happen throughout the day. Sometimes they're a bit bigger, but usually it's like the more minor situations of um, ba like bad choices that are made. Now there's some situations where kids are it's not just bad choices that affect them. They're starting to be some either like uh, aggressive behaviors, I guess, where they're throwing things or hitting or other um, situations that are happening. And those become really hard because in those situations where a child may be aggressive or they may be throwing things or they could be hurting somebody, not only is their um, stress levels very high, so are yours. So as a teacher, as an educator, you need to realize that if their stress level is high, if they're acting aggressively and they're at a 10, you need to make sure that your body language and your voice level, you remain at a, at a one. Like you need to stay calm, cool, and collected in that situation because if you are also at a 10, you're escalating the situation instead of bringing it down. Um, for aggressive kids, kids that are throwing things, things that are... Um, bigger situations for classroom management wise, it's really hard because each kid is different. Each kid has a different trigger. Each kid needs something different from you and you have to find that for each child. So uh, it can be so many different things. Is it a sensory issue? Is there, um, is it a sensory issue? Is it, um, something that's biological like they've had they haven't had enough to eat today or they're really tired or they haven't had enough to drink so there's lots of different things that could be going on in that little body that could be um making them act the way they are but we have to remember that they they don't want to be acting this way they're lashing out they're they're being aggressive or they're doing things that are and are not supposed to it's not their fault their, their little body, something is going on. It's They're trying to communicate something to you. And it's, as an educator, your job to find out what that is, whether you get outside help to help you try to figure out what that is. It's talking with the parents to try to figure out what that is. But it's, it's not something that's easily solved with just like a strategy. It's really something that you have to work with, with your school community, with your family and the child to figure out what's going on because that can be something that's a lot deeper and a lot harder to um, figure out what's going on. And I know that a lot of educators are um, working in classrooms where this is becoming um, an issue for them and they're getting students that are, are having a lot of trouble regulating themselves in a kindergarten classroom. And... I'm sorry, I'm, I do not have an answer for that because it, it really is, there is no one size fits all solution for these poor kids that are, are having the, these difficulties. And yeah, it, it's the, my best advice for you is, is to make sure you're staying calm. You're trying to figure out what's the cause of the behaviors and trying to solve that cause and involving the families as much as you can and trying to figure out what's going on and involving other professionals to help you and and knowing that you're not alone and that there's other people out there to help you with that kind of stuff also helps but yeah i do not have a solution for that because again it, it's it's not going to be a clip chart it's not going to be dojo points that help you solve those real um big behaviors um sorry to leave it on such a negative note there but yeah, do you have anything that you use for classroom management that works um, for you? So maybe you do use a clip chart or you use dojo points and you have a really great reason behind it and I just have never thought of it that way. I wanna hear your perspective. Maybe you use something else like how I use how to fill your bucket. Maybe you use something like that, but something different. I'd love to hear about that too. Make sure that if you are on YouTube, you leave a comment down below. If you're listening to this on a podcast, reach out to me on Instagram. I'm at Creative Kindergarten Blog on TPT. 
or my creative kindergarten blog.com you can find me there or on Facebook I'll leave all of those um, links for all of that in the show notes for you so you can actually find me and so yeah I really want to hear what you guys have to think what are your best classroom management tips and if I get some really great ones I'll make sure I share them out and I talk about them over on my social media I want to thank you guys so much for joining me again for uh, my podcast. I really have a great time coming and talking to you guys and just talking through and thinking about all these things and putting them into words and really reflecting on my practice and, and trying to become a better educator in the process. I know that sounds weird that me talking to a podcast to you guys makes me a better better educator but really having to reflect on these topics and talk about them really makes me think about what I do and why and it does really make me a better educator in that way so I really want to thank you guys for tuning in for sending your ideas for podcasts I'd love to hear if there's anything else you'd like to hear from me and yeah so make sure you're following me here Um, hit a like if you're on YouTube leave a rating if you're on a podcast and I will see you all next week thank you Thank <music> you.